Right, and um, let me introduce um, our speaker and then I'll hand the presentation over to her. So Dr. Ritu Agrawal is a public health management professional uh, working in the domain of sexual, reproductive, maternal and newborn health. Uh, she has done MPH from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in the UK and is a trained obstetrician and gynaecologist. She's worked with the Centre for Maternal and Newborn Health at the University of Liverpool. She's worked with the World Health Organization and in UNICEF and country offices in India. She's a senior professional with 16 years of cumulative experience in public health, clinical obstetrics and gynaecology. And she provides quality improvement strategies and frameworks for the successful management and expansion of public health interventions. She identifies new strategies and innovations for public health improvement. And to her accolade, she has co-authored more than 15 national guidelines the latest one is a national operation plan for midwifery released during the Partners Global Forum in December of last year. She has many publications in peer-reviewed journals and has been a part of, the, of national and international research initiatives. And currently she works as the Deputy Director for Sexual Reproduction, Reproductive Health and Rights with the MAMTA Health Institute for Mother and Child in New Delhi in India. So it's my pleasure to welcome Ritu Agrawal. Thank you very much, Chris. Yes. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. At the outset, it's an honor to present this August gathering on this international midwifery day. I'm presenting on behalf of Mamta Health Institute for Mother and Child. We are working predominantly in the area of sexual and reproductive health and known for working with community and health systems. I'm thankful to my co-authors who have been of immense support to me. And I'm an obstetrician and a public health professional by training who is working in the area of sexual and reproductive health from the last two decades now. In fact, this is a thanksgiving moment for me to all those midwives who taught me patient care patient safety, and labor room protocols. To increase women's access to quality midwifery services has become a focus of global efforts, realizing that it is the right of every woman to receive the best possible health care during pregnancy and childbirth. With this perspective, I'm here presenting on how to optimize health workers' role for improved quality of reproductive and newborn health care services by promoting midwife-led care. My presentation, rather this brief journey with you of few minutes, will take you through the Indian scenario and burden of preventable deaths. This is the outline of my presentation where I wish you to walk with me on why midwives are ideal while optimizing health workers' role in RMNCH space and how the newly launched program on midwives will pay dividends in long run for India. To begin this, let me present some demographic data reflecting on disparities between Southeast Asian countries and India. I am here reflecting on Southeast Asia status to emphasize the magnitude of India and its diversity. The Southeast Asia region is made up of 11 countries with over 1.8 billion people with India's population contributing to 1.2 billion. The diversity of people and the health situation everywhere requires, on the demand side, a good understanding of the emerging socioeconomic, epidemiologic, and demographic patterns with due sensitivity to disadvantaged populations and vulnerable segments of the society. On the supply side, it is equally crucial to have a good understanding of the health systems the circumstances and political economy under which they operate. In this context, I would say that midwives are really a cost-effective fit. Within the continuum of reproductive health care, 
antenatal care increases the likelihood of an institutional delivery and acts as a potential determinant in reduction of maternal morbidity and mortality, low birth weights, perinatal and infant mortality. The figure in front of you reflects the National Family Health Survey 4 data where 74% of mothers had one ANC visit and only 51% had four ANC visits. The good point here is that 91% of would-be mothers who had four ANC visits delivered in a health facility. But the not so good thing is that this clearly implies loss of contact with many pregnant women after their first visit. The blue row below shows the regional status of health workforce density per 10,000 population. And where you can see India is no different. Almost all countries are struggling with the issue of human resource. This is to link why task shifting is of paramount importance and how investing in midwives will be helpful. I don't have to speak about significance of six skilled birth attendants in this August gathering. The blue highlighter bar around India is showing the date of institutional delivery. Our national average of institutional delivery is 79%. However, in a public health facility, it is still 52%. In addition, most of these deliveries are happening at tertiary level of healthcare system. The reasons for low attendance are distance from home to facilities more, there is no transportation and high out-of-pocket expenses. This further clearly points to a missing link in the healthcare system where promotion of access to healthcare alone is not sufficient. It points towards the non-homogeneous nature of pregnant women whose ask is to understand the social system around them. Again, the lower blue bro is showing India is no different. Under such low availability of human resource, task shifting is a necessity and not an option. In an era of digitalization, I unapologetically, I unapologetically say that there is no health without a workforce. The Lancet 2014 guides that midwifery is associated with efficient use of resources and improved birth outcomes when provided by the professionally trained midwives. Postnatal care within two days of delivery for mother and her newborn is not only important, but also reflects the efficiency of the health system, reach of human resource and community processes. 73% of urban women received a postnatal check within two days compared with 62% of rural women. To add, there is a positive relationship between the mother's level of education and postnatal checks. In recent years, India's economic growth has been steady with GDP growth above 8% per annum. However, health challenges have still remained for a large proportion of the population. 70% of the Indian population lives in rural areas and among them, the most vulnerable population are the pregnant women and children who get disproportionately affected. Though I can proudly say that India noticed significant improvement in maternal and neonatal outcomes, observed rapid expansion in healthcare delivery infrastructure, and still experiencing improvement in overall human development index after the launch of the National Health Mission. The maternal mortality ratio has also declined by 77% from 556 to 130 per 100,000 live births in few decades. A neonatal mortality rate has also come down. However, this impressive increase has not led to commensurate decline in maternal mortality and neonatal mortality. As per the Rural Health Statistics 2016, there is a 77% shortage of obstetricians at middle level of our healthcare facilities. As a result, the tertiary level is getting overcrowded and those who need special attention of doctors or specialists suffer. The rising rates of cesarean sections are alarming. 
cesarean sections have almost doubled from 9% to 17% in last decade. The disaggregated data shows high cesarean sections among first births. They are more in private sector health facilities, in urban areas, and among more educated women. However, the most worrisome part is increasing complications during second or subsequent deliveries. There are rising rates of placenta accreta and out of pocket expenses averaging to 46 US dollars. I don't have to inform the able audience that social determinants are operational at various levels and undoubtedly play a detrimental role. India's population is the second largest in the world and is 70% rural and the status of women is low. Overall coverage of evidence-based interventions has increased over the past decades, but still hasn't reached the desired level. Ensuring availability for skill attendance and birth in remote facilities remains a challenge when there is overall shortage of skilled human resource. As per WHO, the task shifting or task sharing is a process of delegation, enabling mid-level healthcare professionals to provide clinical services and procedures. It deals with the efficient use of human resources and help increase coverage, access, and efficiency of healthcare service delivery while remaining cost-effective. Within this context, to optimize health workers' role and expand the resource pool, Task shifting is important and will help with improved ratio of providers to women, amount of doctor's time getting freed up for more specialized jobs, and overall improvement in quality of care. Global evidence shows that midwives trained to international standards can take care of 87% of essential newborn and maternal services. Since this I have covered already in my previous slides, so I'll just skip this slide. Taking example of contraception in task shifting. Contraception is an inexpensive and cost-effective intervention, but health workforce shortage and restrictive policies on the roles of mid and lower level cadres limit access to effective contraceptive methods in many settings. The high unmet need, need shows disconnection between a woman's fertility preferences and what she does about them. She wants to avoid conceiving, but fails to do what is needed to prevent pregnancy. As informed earlier, that almost 40% of our women reported during last survey the lack of awareness about the contraceptive methods, despite the fact that there is a growing demand for both limiting and spacing births. The lack of women's autonomy in reproductive decision-making, compounded by poor male involvement in sexual and reproductive health matters. Though India has already enabled mid and lower level cadres of health workers to deliver a range of contraceptive methods, however, authorization to provide basket of contraceptive choices are limited. The actual history here dates back to 1872, when few nurses were trained in New Delhi and then battery of work followed in relation to midwives. But then later, in 1946, the board committee stressed on the need of professional midwives. Today, here, I'm reflecting upon learnings from 2002 onwards, when Indian Nursing Council introduced post-basic diploma in nurse practitioner midwife, when the program did not take up the intended shape due to lack of role clarity among staff nurses and auxiliary nurse midwives, lack of integration into the existing health system. Probably the health system was not ready to accept midwives as a separate cadre at that point of time. Lack of clearly defined career progression pathway, making it difficult for the newly introduced midwives to move forward and lack of legal and regulatory framework. All these together pose a significant challenge. Apologies. This slide is crowded, but this is just to flag the depth of analysis which was undertaken by Indian government and experts before the launch of our midwifery program in December. The slide is reflecting the specific areas and gaps with the earlier curriculum in nurse practitioner in midwifery course against the ICM standards. So I echo what former Secretary General of the United Nations said 
to ensure every woman and her newborn have access to quality midwifery services demands bold steps. Although overcoming failures is necessary, but learnings from failure is most essential. In December 2018, during a global event, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare made the landmark announcement to initiate midwife-led healthcare services and introduced new CADA, the midwife. These were in fact very warm moments which were ingrained for lifetime for many, many like me. The objectives of the new midwifery program are in context with a public health scenario as shown in slide eight, which focuses on improvement of access to quality maternal and newborn health services. So the new objectives of the midwifery program is promotion of natural birthing, promotion of positive childbirthing experience, promotion of respectful maternity care, identification, management, and referral of women and newborns experiencing complications, and finally, to decongest higher level of healthcare facilities. At a personal level, I wish the midwives to ensure a behavior that fulfills women's personal expectations of giving birth to a healthy baby in a clinically and psychologically safe environment in hands of a competent midwife. My personal and professional experience taught me that this is possible only when a midwife tries to be kind and compassionate, not only towards the woman, but her family and her newborn. And I'm very helpful, hopeful that this will be palpable soon across the country. Out of all objectives, I picked the respectful care because it utilizes the midwife led philosophy of care. And my belief is that one happy woman going back to community motivates 10 others to come into the institutional fold. So the key features of our midwifery program are promotion of task shifting, recognition and status by providing career progression, Indian nursing council and respective state councils are working towards certification, regulation and legal protection of midwives and for their autonomous practice, establishment of task forces to overview program at every level, non-rotatory duty of trained midwives for reasons known to everyone here. The criteria, as you can see, is very well defined. At these facilities, the midwives will be the first point of contact. The midwife-led healthcare facilities will be at all high case load facilities, even in hard to reach areas and where the rate of home deliveries are high. Availability of a specialist with established referral linkages forward with tertiary level of healthcare facility and backward with community is a must. Once functional, these facilities will also help in reduction of second delay due to transportation, reduction of out of pocket expenses, and improve access and coverage, with which I see increased number of antenatal and postnatal visits for both mother and her newborn. The scope of care covers the continuum of care from from planning, antenatal care, internatal and postnatal care of mother and newborn. For education and training, <clears throat> the curriculum is based on adapted global ICM competencies. The focus will be here on continuous competency assessments of educator and care providers both. Now, a special directive has come into force in India, which states that midwifery educators will have dual role as clinician and teacher. I again see this having a dual impact on our public health. One, educator skills will remain intact and during classroom or demonstration classes, they will be able to share their own experiences and build on case scenarios to help students learn. Two, the other best part, what I feel is standardization of technical protocols. There won't be gap in practice and teaching. What you're teaching is what you are practicing. This slide is reflecting the selection criteria to apply for new professional training in midwifery. A registered nurse, registered midwife with GNM or BSc nursing 
and with two years of work experience can apply for this course. The midwifery training curriculum will be based on revised ICM essential four competencies. Ability of the training to be on par with global standards. It is imperative to focus on educators and their trainings. The selection criteria for midwifery educators is well defined as you can see in this slide. A cascade model will be used and the roles and responsibilities are again as per WHO and ICM recommendations. As far challenges are concerned, WHO Boolean analysis states, any country to accelerate progress, a range of factors inside and outside the health sector need to be acknowledged. This further implies that no single factor or strategy or configuration can work to get the desired results in acceleration of health. At one hand, barriers or challenges like income inequalities geographical disparities and sociocultural practices limit acceleration processes. However, on the other hand, enablers like women's participation in workforce, higher education, cross-sectoral convergence and collaboration with different stakeholders, involvement of local leaders, accelerate processes. In this context, selection of right willing in-service candidates, right educators, and right learning environment, which include use of adult training methodologies, focus on cognitive functions, and working in a team-based manner is challenging, but not impossible. Considering size of India, achieving optimum number of professionally trained midwives before 2030 may pose a challenge. Here, I'm referring to requirement of number of educators number of training institutes and number of care providers to achieve saturation to be able to palpate the change. From a long time, midwifery was simmering under the surface, but now there is a political commitment and ambient governance to drive this agenda with full acceleration. Being an OBGYN present in this space already informs the audience that this step is welcome. The way forward is to strengthen accountability mechanisms at various levels. Understanding of the healthcare market and market forces and role of private sector is the next step in our onward journey. Positive attitude towards innovation and practices and keeping ourselves evolving with new evidence is the way to go. Thank you very much for listening out to me. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Any questions are welcome. Um, Portia wants to applaud. If you highlight your own name, um, you can applaud by setting your status, uh, which is what I'm about to do, like that. Um, thank you very much, um, Ritu, for that. Um, Obviously, there were some people were really interested because there were quite a few comments going through. So I'd like to floor, throw the floor open to questions. Does anyone have any questions for Ritu? You can put them in the chat box if you want to speak. Um, I can enable a microphone for you. But if you do ask a question verbally, I would ask you to put it in the um, tech chat box too. So any questions, please? Okay, um, Portia, I will ask, there are several questions coming in now. Can we start with Deepa's question? Um, Deepa says there's no scope for direct entry education. And why is that, Ritu? So, uh, presently, this is a conscious decision with Government of India that there won't be a direct entry education. Probably we are not prepared for this course. We need to first strengthen our pre-service courses and then look forward to the direct entry. It may happen or 
you know it may not happen but currently we are india government is close to this and with great difficulties i'm telling you with great difficulties everybody has come on board to launch the midwife as a carder and the midwife midwife led care services so we are not currently looking forward to direct entry education but still we are not closed if we have get if we get enough evidences in support of direct entry education then it may happen okay thank you for that um, Portia would like to ask a question i think you should be able to unmute now uh, Portia, okay, try so unmuting so there is a question why is there a restriction on having been a nurse prior undertaking midwifery training uh, so i would say that you know there are there are different public health cadres also in india who are uh, who look forward to apply for this midwifery course but currently we are restricting ourselves to uh, gnm and bsc courses because we did the thorough evaluation of their course content and we found even the auxiliary nurse midwife course content is lagging behind you know it needs to match up the course content for the midwife so gnm and the bsc public health nurse is the eligible candidate for this hope this thanks. this satisfies your question thanks um Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Portia would like to speak. Portia, when you've asked your question, please will you also type in the in the chat so we will see it there. So go ahead now, Portia. Hmm, I'm afraid we can't. Uh, so, so yeah, so so there is one more question actually. So which. Um, we see midwifery as an autonomous profession that is why the cadre has been started if there if there won't be a cadre you know there won't be an autonomous profession so i i informed you in my uh, one of my present in my slide that in a nursing council and any other and many of our state councils are working towards making it autonomous by providing the legal authority and the autonomous character to the entire midwives and the midwifery framework yes yeah, so this will be a long thing you know obstetric led culture will be addressed in regard so being an obstetrician you know many of our um, of uh, obstetrician forums are open currently to introduce midwife and they are welcoming midwife we were not expecting this kind of a you know we were also not expecting this but you know everybody has come forward to welcome midwives and midwife led care health services because currently everybody realizes that in india an indian women are suffering because of lack of human resource and in rural areas especially and in hard to reach areas there is significant number of less number of people working in the area okay. um so next question um yeah. we have a question from sarah how will the obstetric led culture be addressed in regarding yeah, so, to allowing midwife led services so, so th this i see there is some potential challenges you know in the private sector but not in the public sector because in pri public sector people would we, we will be able to handle and train most of our uh, midwives and obstetricians and the specialists and it is not only the obstetricians actually it is the allied healthcare professionals also who working in a team with the midwife who needs to give respect and support to the this newly introduced cadre initially there would be some resistance but i think with the um, government intervening and government and the nursing council intervening at every step i see this as a big support system rather than a challenge so i think our midwives will be able to handle and we will be training our midwives to handle all these during our 18 months course also so for this behavior change and everything for the forward looking for the onward journey we will prepare them Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Does that, does that answer the question, Sarah? Yeah. 
So okay. Um, Portia has asked a question around, um, you, you talked a little bit about it earlier, I think, about the restrictive policies against contraception in India. Perhaps you could then um, enlarge on that for us, Ritu. So, um, I, Portia, I really did not understand your question because um, this is in regard to the policy framework or to the implementation round because we have very clear policies. Uh, in terms of and the policies are not restricting somehow about the contraception that is the that is the gap we have the policies in place but the implementation level at the implementation level we are not able to implement it properly because the contraception and the sexual health matters is a very sensitive issue and the community comes very close and indian diversity offers it a very big challenge currently to implement contraception in india somewhere you know injectable contraceptives are welcome and somewhere it is not so it is quite a diverse situation currently with us but indian government is dealing with it and we are preparing our frontline workers on contraception policies and to make them implement so many of the uh, non-governmental organizations and local partnerships we are encouraging and the local leaders are getting on board so that you know contraception needs for the married as well as for the unmarried woman can be met so we are taking young people on board so probably the target force is now the adolescent age group which is aging from you know 14 to 19 or 22 so that is our focus group currently Okay, thank you. Does that uh, does that answer your question, Portia? Uh, legal support of religious barriers to contraception. Uh, legal support of religious barriers, uh, you know, there are two different contradictory things. So uh, there are no religious barriers here. You know, that religious barriers always exist in the society and that is the biggest challenge. But but the policies are not do not consider the religious barriers. They are for the public in general and they do not consider the religious barriers. So we are not divided on that front. The policies, I think, uh, yeah. I think Portia, I think Portia's question is, she wondered if, um, the, if there are religious, um, religious, what's the word I'm looking for? If, if some religions are against some methods of contraception and the, the law then, um, enshrines those religious objections so that the state has effectively made some things difficult or illegal uh, because they're frowned on by a religion one or more of your religion no 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 no, no. it's it's not like that you know okay those state comments though though state health is a state subject of this problem we call state as a problem provinces okay. called state here so it's a state subject but you know nothing related to contraception contraception is allowed and females are females can take anything from the basket of choice but the only thing is female itself because of the rural population and the uneducated strata of the uh, you know uh, background characteristic it does not make them aware what is available to them so they are not able to utilize so the unmet need is still high people are not aware people are not utilizing the services provided and those which are available are little uh, you know they are, people are not very competent to provide them so so, so it's fun it's fun so it's fundamentally an access problem rather than a rules problem Yes, so it is an access problem along with somewhere it is availability and uh, out-of-pocket expenses to reach that thing. understand. Okay, thank you. Um, Deepa has asked another question now. What's the legality of midw midwives who are willing to work in India, or presumably therefore from another country, uh, to increase access to midwifery care, but they're not 
they're not nurses but they are professional midwives with a mid midwifery registration so yeah, so, so, so i'll answer yes yeah, sure so, uh, so this this one we have taken special consideration since we are open to all those midwives who are working who are indian and who are not indian who are working around and you know in the globe and who have good uh, background of midwifery are welcome in india so indian nursing council would make a special provision for one year uh, sub, you know, um, and they will give a one year um, period for them to come to India and practice. And at the end of one year, that license can be renewed. So this is a special provision which will come into play, you know, in one in few months now because uh, Indian Nursing Council is currently working on them. And during the last expert group decision uh, meeting, this was taken a decision. So I'm sure they'll be able to implement, but I will take your work forward. I work forward with the Indian Nursing Council and ask them to expedite their work. Thanks. Um, and Thank Kerry you. asks, have you seen Kerry's question? Are there plans for a separate midwifery council eventually? So, so Kerry, there are no uh, plans currently for separate midwifery council, but I am glad to inform you that the Indian Nursing Council has uh, uh, put their name for to change to Indian Nursing and Midwifery Council, and Parliament has passed that bill, and it will be soon not the Indian Nursing Council, but Indian Nursing Midwifery Council. So there would be one body who would be looking at the nursing and midwifery. There won't be a separate midwifery council per se. Yes, this is a very big step, Deepa, and we need all luck. Thank you very much. OK, uh, we have a few minutes Thank left, so we have time, we have time for one. <laughs> Indeed. We have time for one or two more questions if people still have questions to ask. Are you want to sit out or? This is annoying me. This edge yeah. here on it or something. Yeah. Um, that's got nothing to do with the. Um, the, um, the no, I can hear some background noise, Deb. You want me? Okay, um, I think we're coming to the close now. I'm about to move on to final um, slides. Oh, thank you, Rita, for sharing your email. Um, if if you do lose touch with, if you don't capture Ritu's uh, details and you do want to contact her, then of course you can always come via us at, at VIDM. But if you connect directly with Ritu, that would be brilliant. Um, thank you very much, Rita. Um, that was a really interesting presentation. Um, and we can obviously see that um, a lot of people were engaged with, what, with the progress you're making in, um, in India. Thank you very much, Chris, and thank you very much, everyone.